The Bounty Hunters Captain Schmidt, if you have the time, I'd like some answers. Madame Stepanova states in a way that makes it clear she's not asking. I don't. Wait for us to properly be underway without spooking our officer escort and being flagged as pirates when we enter Centris space. The Chainbreaker is well armed, but not invulnerable, Pukey says as the Chainbreaker gets underway. Her glare is then ignored and she walks up to stand beside him. I am unused to being ignored. Get used to it. The entire population of the human species is so small compared to the galaxy at large that we could be swallowed up in a census rounding error. The only attention we get is due to being an unusual species or when we do something noteworthy. Pukey remarks before snorting. Although your age will likely draw some comments, much in the way my being a man does. My age. Wait 30 minutes and calm yourself. We will discuss this two decks down in the room labeled Jawbone. Pukey says, still not looking at her as he surveys the bridge and ensures that everything goes perfectly. Madame Stepanova departs as quiet as a whisper before she suddenly slams her cane down and glares back at him. He does not care. As she moves her old bones creaking and aching, she pushes the information around in her mind. There had been none of the telltale signs of deception, but the captain had admitted to being trained by that flouting fool Masterson. She refuses to go down that memory road that leads to a room with a restraining chair and several bloody tools joined by a notebook full of lies. She gathers a fair amount of the crew she's certain are loyal and the few that will try to sneak in if not invited might as well head off unnecessary complications. They're here for information, not blood. Jawbone is a large circular room with numerous chairs, right next to a huge pair of jawbones so massive they circle the room. In many places, the stupidly huge bones had been carved into to make little shelves and cup holders. There's a strange device in the middle of the room that all the chairs and sofas point towards. She pads around and quickly gets to one of the chairs that have a view of the entrance of the room. The rest that do that are quickly fought over like a demented case of musical chairs by the younger information gatherers and spies. This bit of light stupidity takes up the allotted time and numerous people enter the room. Captain Schmidt, the tiny reptile woman that inexplicably has pronounced breasts and hips, the equally inexplicable snake-legged young man with long hair that drapes over his face. Two of the large monster women, one with black and yellow fur and a clear leather fetish, the other white and bright green and clearly going for the naughty librarian look. The robotic snake woman that's likely a pervert sex toy, two more officers from the actual ship, one of them Asian, likely Korean, and the other one a large black man with a very short mohawk. Finally, the actual officer escorting them as well walks in. This is going to be her most bizarre interrogation yet. She's including her time with Masterson when he was caught dressed as a baby from the Opera Les Mamelles de Tiresias. The galling bit was that he had stayed in character the entire time. Everyone but Pukey finds a seat and he presses a few buttons on his communicator. The very center of the room with the device rises up to form a table. Feel free to stand or sit. I am now answering questions. But first, a word of warning. Things are very, very different than what anyone expected. I have brought a nice example of a lot of my crew that have witnessed the darker parts of the galaxy firsthand, from slavery to cannibalism, from the destruction of the identity to organ theft, all of us have witnessed or suffered atrocities that are the stuff of nightmares. She says nothing to that and quickly scans their features again. The cut over Captain Schmidt's eye is long and likely went to the bone. The edges are ragged, suggesting the blade was either blunt or jagged. It was not a clean cut. His other main wound is hidden mostly by his shirt, but the unusual folds of his shirt sleeve suggest the wound went up to and took the shoulder. There is no hiding the scars behind hair when it comes to the serpent boy, though. 
His every movement parts it ever so and shows brutal masses of scar tissue. Pieces have been torn out of the boy's face. He also makes a point of hiding his hands as if ashamed. There are also segments of his tail that are a little too shiny and with a slight break in the scale patterns, likely implants or freshly healed portions. The hardness around the big black monster is undeniable. She's delved deep and is openly protecting the smaller green and white one. She's seen things. The Korean man returns her gaze with an incredible intensity, as does the black man. The tiny reptile woman is busy comforting the serpent. She dismisses the robot. One master actor is rare. Two in a room is an outright conspiracy, and if you have three, then you're in the middle of an intelligence division, a party, or a movie studio. Seven is not happening. One of you would have made a mistake. Explain yourselves. What have you all endured? She asks softer than before. If they're being honest, then this mission just got a lot more complicated and needed a touch a lot more delicate than hers, or anyone from the Lance for that matter. Myself and Mr. T here have witnessed the slaughters and brutality of many. We've had things the easiest in that we've only really seen things, Tang says and Mr. T nods. I've had it fairly easy too, only seeing the obscenity that some women are capable of and not having it committed to me. But I've had to use my teeth and claws to keep mad women with plasma blades from gouging out my eyes with burning hot pokers or ramming them into some poor fool that's too close to the rampaging lunatic. I haven't always succeeded. Onyx admits her tone straining near the end. I've spent decades in debt bondage, barely making enough to eat and sleeping in my workplace. Not quite slavery, but at that point the difference is academic. I train my whole life to help people just to end up in chains, Cindy admits and Scaly pulls her up into a hug. Pukey looks over the group and Scaly is pointedly not looking at him as Jade nods, he understands. Myself, Jade there and my adoptive son Slytherin Schmidt, also called Scaly, have all suffered things a bit more viscerally. The damage done to Scaly and myself is physically apparent with associated psychological trauma. Jade, on the other hand, was placed in a regenerative state and used as an organ farm. We don't know how long she was in that state, but it was done in such a way as to completely wipe her memories prior to waking up in our care. Well, that. We met during an assassination of a dear family friend. She was not only killed in front of a crowd, but her pregnant stomach was detonated by a second attack. Litha states and Madame Stepanova goes quiet at that. She hadn't expected the robot to have a traumatic story as well. Why? In the end? Because some spiteful monster had an opportunity fall into their lap and took it, Pukey says with his arms crossed. The galaxy is dangerous. Is the point made? You're an overdramatic child, but yes, the point is made, Madame Stepanova says. And what about you, miss? You're an officer of the law. Can you confirm these stories? Individually, no. But outside of prosperous space, these kinds of things can happen. Official forces are spread thin in distant space, are non-existent in frontier space and unheard of in wild space, Officer Shield offers. Those? What do those names mean? She presses. We're in prosperous space, the well-traveled, well-organized and civilized part of the galaxy. It runs along the Axiom lanes where there's reliable shipping and military response times. Distant space is further out and generally within a day or two's travel. It's more rugged and independent but still easily defended and supplied. Frontier space is even further from supply and protection, a week, perhaps two out. Fiercely independent, this is where people go when they want to live life their way, with all the consequences that entails. Further out is wild space, which is unexplored, completely unprotected and unsupplied. It's a haven for pirates, warlords, and criminals. If you go out there, you're on your own. And our homeworld of Earth, in cruel space? Until your Admiral Cistern emerged, we thought it was devoid of all life. Conventional logic and understanding says that there can't be civilization inside that hellhole. 
but you're here, from there. And what of our population in the billions? What does that, Madam Stepanova begins to ask, but there's a slight involuntary snort from Officer Shield. So billions is a small number. Oh my yes, very much so. Your world has the population of perhaps a frontier planet. Though there are some stations and wild worlds that have populations in the billions. Pukey's eyebrows go up. There are stations in the billions. They must be massive. The biggest we've seen went into the millions. Funny how that never came up. But yes, Akatar and Spin is on the smaller side of medium for a residential space station. It's mostly a port of call for more unsavory elements at the edge of frontier space and distant space. Letha Power Coil says, glancing at Officer Shield. Well, that explains why it was so easy to collect so many bounties there. He notes, and Officer Shield suppresses a snort of amusement. If you went to a pirate port and started gathering bounties, then the questions I have is why is this place not stacked high in every inch of space with collected proof or bodies, and how are you still alive? The officer asks somewhat incredulously. Criminals have codes. Play along and you can get away with just about anything. So long as we didn't start the fight, we were golden. If taking them for their bounty was obviously a punishment for attacking us, then we could do it openly. Hell, we did it while singing on more than a few, just to really rub it in that we were retaliating. If I got looking through the storage compartments of this ship, I'm going to find entire stacks of women on the most wanted lists in stasis, won't I? Officer Shield asks. Yes, very much so, Pukey admits, and she shakes her head in amusement. Madam Stepanova, this is an absurdly large and dangerous galaxy. A good way to get an idea of scale are the bones in this room. It was from a Carnex that was hitting populated areas with its mate. He's cut off by an impressed whistle from the officer as she looks around. I thought these were scavenged. You actually killed a Carnex. With what? Two, and we custom built some really powerful kinetic weapons to do the job. We call them pop guns, both as a joke and a warning. The warning being that if you hold them even slightly wrong, then they will pop your arm right out of its socket. Tang answers before chuckling. For those that understand, imagine crossing an elephant gun with a howitzer and an anti-material rifle. They're single-shot monsters powerful enough to threaten starships and small enough to be carried by a single person. But there's so much weight involved that you're not carrying a lot of ammo. These things fire what are basically custom tank or artillery rounds. Terrifying, Madame Stepanova states dryly. What about this place we're going to? Centris? Can you summarize it? Summarize? Overpopulated and understaffed. Bloated with wealth and underfunded. Corrupt to the core and sustained by the corruption. Pukey says before shrugging. It's the central point for the vast majority of galactic politics. All the associated things showed up as well, but a single planet is simply not enough for even a fraction of the infrastructure management it needs. Imagine if the United Nations had to run every little thing that happened on Earth without expanding the Council. In fact, pare it down to a tenth its current size and heap the workload onto the people and support staff remaining. That's what Centris is. So much work for so few people that asking them to do their jobs is downright unreasonable. She holds up a finger and takes a few moments to try and digest that. She looks over everyone and there's no sign of deception. The officer is telling in that there's an aura of near palpable frustration around her. So someone had the smart idea of trying to centralize as much of the governmental duties onto a single planet as possible and it all careened into a massively corrupt traffic jam, essentially. Nothing can get done because you have to move an entire sedentary system to get any progress. Some baby steps have been accomplished, but that's mostly because people are willing to bend a bit more than normal for men in the galaxy. Without that, we likely wouldn't have gotten anywhere. I'm beginning to understand the scope of the threat. 
although I would like to see more about the aliens that surround us. We're going to be here a while. There's a huge number, and that's without touching culture, religion, animals, plants, and many, many other such things. Pukey says even as Cindy is brought up into a hug from Scaly. You guys can leave now if you need to. They're believing us now, so I won't need a much backup. 